Thank you. Well, one of the signature refrains in the blockbuster Broadway musical Hamilton, and it is a blockbuster, it's not just the standard New York hype that we've all come to expect. One of the signature refrains is what a wonderful time it is to be alive right now. And when you think about it, indeed it was. It was a time when a remarkable collection of people dared seize this nation's freedom from one of the great empires of the time in pursuit of what they so eloquently articulated, a more perfect union. Unfortunately, despite their collective genius, the founders were mere mortals. So when it came to the most intractable issue of their time, the status of black people in this new nation, they simply kicked the can down the road. The net result, of course, is that since the founders left the stage, race and race relations have been at the center of all honest conversations about America and about American institutions, including the academy. Now, certainly, as we consider the arc of our nation's history, there are many, many reasons to believe we've made tremendous progress. Indeed, there are too many examples of racial progress to document in our short time together. But the most obvious, of course, is that a black man, Barack Obama, a Chicago native son, is president. Now, notwithstanding this obvious progress, many point with a great deal of despair to the civil unrest and black student protests that we're seeing today, events that seem eerily similar to what took place 40 years ago, and wonder if we're as far along as we'd hoped. Well, I believe that a fair comparison of the student protests of yesteryear with those of the day is in fact encouraging. And it's encouraging because while in some cases we are retracing ground we thought we'd conquered, others show that there's an opportunity for us to move our conversations and move our actions to a higher and more mature level. But to take advantage of the opportunity, I believe we have to come to those conversations prepared to listen and engage honestly. And the good news from my perspective is that Williams is taking a leadership role in listening and engaging with honesty. Now as we revisit the protests of yesteryear, it is instructive to start with the overall backdrop for those protests. And an important part of that backdrop was, of course, the Civil Rights Movement, where there had been some very important successes, obviously, including the elimination of de jure segregation, or Jim Crow laws, in the South, leading most notably to the desegregation of public schools and newly vigorous enforcement of black people's right to vote. Almost as important, however, almost imp as important, were the failures of the civil rights movement, including the lack of success removing the all too real de facto barriers in the rest of the country outside of the South. Indeed, Martin Luther King Jr.'s most dismal failure was his effort to attack de facto segregation right here in Chicago leaving in place in Chicago and much of the rest of the country, job discrimination, housing discrimination, the factually, though not legally, segregated public schools that came with housing discrimination, racial bias in criminal charging and sentencing, and pervasive police brutality targeting black people. These failures, we must remember, were profoundly consequential, giving rise to a black power movement arguing that the black community needed to affirm the legitimacy of its culture, establish its own schools, 
and defend itself against police brutality. Now, the failures of the civil rights movement and the limitations of the black power movement fueled even before King's assassination in 1968, the outbreak of deadly riots, riots in Los Angeles, in Detroit, and in Newark. Now, against this larger backdrop, indeed, in many ways, because of it, campuses were changing. With meaningful numbers of black students arriving on predominantly white campuses for the first time. And Williams' experience is illustrative, with the college going from just 10 black students in 1966 to over 120 just by 1974. As we arrived, black students made what I call a claim for presence. The basic message was, we deserve to be here. And it was an important claim to make. Important because there were many people who didn't think so. Some of them, the most extreme voices, didn't think we were capable. And while extreme, they often had very, very credible platforms. Consider William Shockley, a Stanford professor and Nobel-winning physicist who argued quite loudly that black people were inherently inferior. Now, some might wonder how much weight a physicist carried in a debate about something so far afield as the intellectual capabilities of black people. Well, I suggest that to think about how much influence a Nobel Prize confers, even far afield, we need only consider the influence that Paul Krugman has today. While Paul's views are the antithesis of Shockley's, he is an economics Nobelist who opines on social and political issues that go well beyond economics. And he has a very wide following. Now, this, this claim for presence that black students were making was also important because beyond the Shockleys of the world, there were a more benign set of voices, arguing that while inherently capable, black students were not sufficiently well prepared for predominantly white schools. Voices best exemplified by Daniel Patrick Moynihan author of the, for black people at least, infamous Moynihan Report. In claiming presence, as we look back, black students were far from genteel. In fact, we were often loud, we were often threatening. Whether taking over Willard Hall at Cornell or Hopkins Hall at Williams. Now, what I think about and describe as claiming presence permeated the student demands of the era, with calls for more black students, more black faculty, black studies programs, black culture, and black spaces. And again, Williams is illustrative. In 1970, black students made 15 demands. And the administration, led by President Sawyer and Provost Williams, accepted 12 of those, most notably agreeing to directly fund the Black Students' Union and add a Black Studies program. Now, in the decades since the early 70s, the presence battles have been resolved on many campuses. And the campuses themselves are clearly better places because of them. Once again, though, Williams is illustrative. So we look at Williams, it has an incredibly diverse student population. A population that's 12% black, 11% Latino, 13% Asian, and 7% international students. 
But beyond the enrollment numbers, as, as impressive as they might be, students are on campus engaging with one another across boundaries in ways that are quite supportive of the college's mission, which is to develop curious, action-oriented, global thought leaders in every important discipline. Now, as I look at what's happening on campuses today, I see Williams as being in one group of schools, and I'll come back to that group in a moment. But there is a second group of schools. Those campuses where the battles of the late 60s and early 70s are still being fought. In some cases, that's because schools have been lukewarm about diversity for so long that they're just now starting to have a meaningful black student presence. And this, in my view, is exemplified by the University of Missouri, where black students are understandably at the stage of saying, we belong here. In other cases, the presence battles rage on uh, because while at one time the schools were diverse and successfully resolved these issues, in the face of concerted legal and political attacks, they've regressed. And they now have so few black students, as in the case of US, uh, UCLA, rather, so few black students that they are once again confronted with the dynamics of presence. Now, I don't believe it's a coincidence that the presence battles at these schools are taking place against a current landscape that very much echoes the backdrop for the presence battles of the past. With persistent racial and ethnic bias in the criminal justice system, unabated police brutality directed at people of color, and the return of urban riots. What frustrates many and provides the disheartening sense of deja vu is that at the schools where the presence remains topical, the demands are very familiar. But in the face of all of this, as I promised at the outset, there are encouraging signs because there is this other set of schools, that group that Williams is part of, now certainly, the overall landscape looms large at these schools as well. Nevertheless, these campuses are diverse. Enrollment of black students and other students of color is high. Black faculty representation has never been higher. In fact, it's at levels that we could only dream of in the 70s. And while there's always room for improvement, black and multicultural programming is center stage. And still, still, even at these schools, there are black student protests, including uh, most notably at both Princeton and Yale. So what gives? What's going on at these places? Well, like their predecessors, Today's student protesters are not always as articulate as we'd like. And that's because despite their intellectual capability, they are, after all, still very young people. And most young people have a thing for the dramatic and they have a thing for the outrageous. <laughs> and that can get in the way of hearing what they're really trying to say. Although I have to admit that I haven't seen anything in today's student protests as dramatic or as outrageous as the guns you saw at the Cornell protests. And as I listen closely to the protests at these schools, those that have successfully resolved issues of presence, this is what I hear. I hear students saying being present is no longer sufficient. We want to love these schools with the intensity that non-minority students and alumni love them. To do that, we have to feel truly embraced. 
And we can't feel truly embraced if we continue to be erased from the institution's narratives about our nation, our world, and most importantly, their narratives about themselves. There's no denying that all too often the narratives have been whitewashed. And this is especially true when it comes to the school's narratives about themselves. If the whole story is told, it will be uncomfortable. It'll be uncomfortable because it's going to diminish some institutional icons. But telling a whole story can also be a catalyst for self-examination and for doing the difficult work of letting go of what needs to be let go. The institutional icons who are at the root of many of these student protests do have troubling histories when it comes to race and when it comes to other important matters. And yet, they helped form the cultures of these schools in both positive and negative ways. What are the implications of this when it comes to how students and others experience a campus today? Or how they'll experience it tomorrow if nothing changes? I think these are fair questions. As I consider Williams, I believe that when it comes to honestly considering its past and telling the full story, the college is among the leaders. I think about the Davis Center, the Williams Multicultural Center named for Allison Davis, a brilliant black Williams alum, his equally brilliant brother John, and other Williams alums in the Davis family. Allison was an academic superstar. But one cruel fact is that this exceptional product of Williams was denied a tenure track position at the college, in all likelihood because Williams simply was not ready for a black member of the faculty. So what has the college done? Well, here's what Williams' webpage about the Davis Center says. It says, neither he nor his younger brother John had any doubt that racial politics were the, course, or the cause of such a blunt rejection. The incident had a profound effect on Allison, who not surprisingly bore a lingering resentment toward Williams for a good deal of the rest of his adult life. I also think about the college's timeout each spring for claiming Williams Day, which is best summed up by its mission statement. Claiming Williams invites the community to acknowledge and understand the uncomfortable reality that not all students, staff, and faculty can equally claim Williams. By challenging the effects of the college's history of inequality that are based on privileges of class, race, ethnicity, gender, sexuality and religion, we will provoke individual, institutional, and cultural change. Most telling is the college's acknowledgement on its webpage about claiming Williams that the day is the result of hurtful racial developments in 2008 that were so disturbing they prompted the cessation of all college activities for a day in order to give everyone a chance to reflect and comment on how they were experiencing Williams. Beyond the heated rhetoric, that's all I believe the students at Princeton and Yale are asking. They're asking those institutions for the full narrative. For Princeton, for example, to stop denying black and other students of color full institutional citizenship by ignoring the fact that Woodrow Wilson was a leading racist segregationist. And by ignoring it, shutting off exploration of what that means for how Princeton thinks and behaves today. Does Princeton have to rename its School of International Affairs or remove Wilson's mural from one of its dining halls? No. 
but it should install permanent plaques in the school and in the dining hall that summarize Wilson's accomplishments and his shortcomings and invite people to learn more about both. That's what it should do. In my view, unless we tell the whole unvarnished story about our on and off campus icons and weave that throughout our curriculum, throughout our narratives about ourselves, black students and other students of color are not fully embraced. They're not full citizens, but merely present. So I see the current protests at schools that like Princeton and Yale are clearly diverse as a sign of maturity, a sign that black and other students of color want to move past merely being present. They want full citizenship, and they want to have the intensely rewarding, unconditional relationships with their colleges and their universities that come with full citizenship. As a black student of the 70s, I think that um, the fact that we have the potential for that kind of mutual embrace represents very, very real progress on our collective journey as a nation towards creating a more perfect union. So thank you for coming today. Thank you for listening to both of us talk about the yearning that so many parts of the college have to be fully embraced. Thank you.